Good evening to our viewers. Uh, welcome to another episode of Bring the World Home, a production of the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. Bring the World Home is a program in which each week we explore the experiences and points of view of a volunteer who served in one of the 132 countries around the world that Peace Corps uh, participates in. And today we have with us Mr. David Wallace. Davis. thank you for uh, joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Glad that you could be here today. Uh, David uh, served in the country of Kazakhstan, uh, which is quite a ways from us here in Hawaii, uh, western, west across the Pacific to uh, right up in Central Asia. Is that? Yeah, Central, Central Asia. Asia right? yeah, yeah. And Kazakhstan is a uh, former uh, country of the uh, Soviet Union, borders on what uh, Siberia and Mongolia and uh, must be a fascinating place. It's, the it's a big place. <laughs> Cent <laughs> yeah, Central Asia was always one of my uh, uh, favorite places to read about uh, growing up. I, it's not much to find in literature, but mm -hmm. uh, you served in Kazakhstan from when to when? 97 to 99. 97 to 99. So you've been away for, uh, from the country and it must have been one of the earliest uh, uh, Peace Corps projects in Kazakhstan, is that correct? Yeah, well, I was part of Cos 5, so I was the, the fifth group, uh -huh. the fifth year there. They were the last Soviet Republic to break off, and I think it was towards the end of 90. And so um, Peace Corps was in there pretty quick after that. So it was like, yeah, I was 97, that was the fifth one. Okay, so, um, and through our conversation earlier, I discovered that you were teaching, teaching English there. Uh, which is uh, kind of a typical Peace Corps assignment uh, yep. nowadays, especially. And um, but I'd like to find out. Uh, you've been away from from the Peace Corps since 1999. Uh, you're a young man. You must have. Uh, h how did you become interested in in joining the Peace Corps? How, how, did you even know about Peace Corps in Kazakhstan prior to your service? I didn't know about Kazakhstan Peace Corps. Um, I knew about Peace Corps from history. I was a history major. And um, I really liked the civil rights movement in Kennedy, and so I, I know all about how he started it, and that was always really interesting to me. And uh, I thought kind of, I think like a lot of folks, that it maybe it, it wasn't heard about as much, and so maybe it just kind of disappeared. And in fact, when I was accepted, and I told a lot of folks, they were like, oh, Peace Corps is still around. <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, but hey, I, it took me a while to get my degree. I kept moving around and, and changing colleges and, and stuff like that. So by the time I finally did graduate, uh, it was kind of like, what am I going to do now? Yeah. And I'm, I can't remember exactly how Peace Corps popped in my head, but I, it, it did. And I, it, mm -hmm. it addressed, like, I've always wanted to travel. I've always been interested in other cultures. I was interested in teaching. So I looked at it as a way to kind of help me meet all those needs at once. Yeah. You applied for the Peace Corps, and uh, did you choose to go to Kazakhstan? Was that to you thought, yeah? I want no, to. I mean, I didn't, like I said, I didn't even think of Central Asia. When I told them my preference would be Eastern Europe, um, okay. and I told them that, you know, really I was open to just about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I told them I probably, you know, Africa might be a bit too much for me, mm -hmm. um, at least for a first go around. So I told them really just, you know, wherever the need was. And so when I got my letter, I was so excited. It's like, yeah, you've been accepted in Peace Corps. And I was, yay. And then it was like, you're going to Kazakhstan. I was like, where is that? <laughs> uh -huh. I think that's, that's normal for many of us. <laughs> uh, my experience was the same. I had to look it up on a map. I never even heard of the country of Malaysia. Um, and so uh, you decided that that would be good enough for you. Did you have, you said uh, in uh, Europe was a preference, or Central Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, what what was the interest there, just from your background in history? Yeah, partly history. I mean, an area that that you don't hear about much. I mean, especially yeah. at that time, and um, especially like Poland. I, I had friends who'd been to Poland, and and that was supposed to be. You know, they had said that that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So, and I was always interested in, in in Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Romania and all those. Yeah. So that that was why I had, had done that. But you know. Like I said, Central Asia didn't even even cross my mind. Mm -hmm. So and so when um, and they told you you were going to be a teacher. Now normally when the Peace Corps uh, group is is uh, progressing to their point of beginning service, there's a, a training program involved and a so ongoing selection process. Once you're selected, you enter into the training. And what uh, did you train in the United States or? No, they flew us. 
to Kazakhstan, we trained in a little desert town in the south called Kapshigai, and there were about 50 in my group, and probably almost half of those were teachers, and the rest were health or environment or business. And we spent about three months training in Kapshigai. We lived with, with host families there. And for the teachers especially, we got pretty intensive training on teaching, teaching English in particular. Um, we lived, like I say, with a host family to get better immersed in the culture, work on the language skills. We had really intense language training in both Russian and Kazakh. So, um, and Kapshigai was, was really, it was in the desert. Um, it was well, quite What quite was that hot. like? It I was, mean, it's it was desert hot. like we think of as hot desert or it's yeah. cold? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I don't know why there's a town there. Or there there's a lake nearby. Or it's, yeah, there is a lake nearby, mm -hmm. which kind of so, seemed odd to me because it was desert. And um, it was also odd to me how humid it got. Uh, during oh, really? the during the summer, uh -huh. but I remember one day in particular it got up to 120 degrees, oh, and I goodness. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I, I told them at the end of training, like, you know, wherever you know, Kazakhstan's a big country, so there's lots of places to be posted. And I said, whatever you do, I just I don't want to be posted in the south. I, I can't deal with this. <laughs> so they put me in Siberia <laughs> and, and teach me a lesson. <laughs> I, what the the uh, experience that you had in in training. Do you think that uh, f as a uh, for Peace Corps, as a as an institution, as a bureaucracy, was the training uh, sufficient to? Yeah, the, the training you? was really good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, we complained about it a little bit and felt that we were being coddled. And you know, they were really uh, Peace Corps does a really um, good job of making sure that you're safe and that you yeah. understand what's going on. You do cultural training. You know, you do the regular language training. Mm -hmm. uh, we had field trips. And uh, then they had like cultural days. I mean, they, they do a really good, well-rounded job. And like I say, safety is, is their number one priority. So they spend an inordinate amount of time on that. So, and, and you know, there was a lot of the, you know, the only really bureaucratic thing about Peace Corps is, is the, the acronyms. There's all the acronyms, you know, RPCV, uh -huh. PCMO, or Peace Corps Medical Officer, stuff like that. So that, that kind of got to be weird and annoying. But I think Peace Corps is technically, it's, it's one of those weird government agencies like the post office that's not yeah. directly, you know, under government control. Yeah. So it wasn't that bad. And you found that um, uh, the preparation they gave you to be an English teacher in a country of, in a former Soviet Union, you you said that uh, they, a lot of emphasis on safety was that uh, because of particular concerns. No, I think uh, they do that. They, they do that everywhere. That. Um, Is there any anti-American aspect to life in Kazakhstan? No, I mean, in some of the older folks, there's there's that all that leftover Soviet propaganda stuff that they got. There's okay. a lot of misinformation. Uh, mm -hmm. There was, there, there still is, I'm sure, a lot of misinformation about America and Americans. But, you know, at this stage, in particular, at the time I was there, there was no, like, over anti-Americanism. It was more curiosity and, you know, them wanting to tell you what they knew about the U.S. and, and get you to explain it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and did they, was their knowledge fairly accurate or... Uh, or well, a source of entertainment. <laughs> yeah, it was, thank you. Yeah, source of entertainment. It was interesting because, of course, the things I remember, most of the things that, that were off, I mean, they had a pretty good sense. But, for example, for some reason, they knew we have 51 states. And, I um, mean, you know, I would try to explain. I think you're probably thinking of, you know, Washington, D.C. is another one. No, you have another one out in the ocean, like Puerto Rico. No. No. You know, they couldn't tell me what the 51st state was, but they knew we had one. Uh -huh. um, in, in their text, when I was teaching, in, in my site, we used, they still were using lots of leftover Soviet textbooks. So mm -hmm. they had all these English drill exercises talking about life in America and how it's a throwaway culture. You know, true to some extent, but they took it to the extreme. It was like in America, uh, you know, once their dishwashers, their microwaves, even their cars break down, they don't bother to get them fixed. They just throw them away and buy new ones. Mm -hmm. So they would ask me stuff like that. I'm like, well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. Um, so yeah, little little things like that, uh -huh. that they, and just other things. I think because they weren't used to, um, they were they were they were brainwashed, you know, for lack of a better word, in, into the Soviet Union was, was all this and America was not. Right. Um, that even weird little things they, they didn't want to believe. Like, even though Kazakhstan's a really large country, the population's only like 17 million. So when I told them that the entire population of the country could fit into New York City, that just, no. I'll when I told them Texas is larger in area than France, no, it is lie. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we didn't uh, land on the moon. That was another one. <laughs> oh, really? Uh -huh. Well, the uh, ideas that, that uh, the Soviet uh, propaganda machine uh, exposed them to uh, uh, probably will take generations oh, to, yeah. to die or be straightened out. Uh, d well, tell us a little bit more about, about the people that you worked with. You worked in high school. Were the students uh, uh, typical teenage uh, people uh, that we'd understand in the United States? Yeah, I mean, they were good kids. Uh, teaching there is so different, I mean, in terms of they still have a tremendous amount of respect for, for teachers. Uh, the kids still have a tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for education. Uh, the schools are different in that they there are 11 grades, but they all are in one school. So the school I taught was was first to 11th grade, all in, in okay. the same school, which was was kind of cool, I think. Um, and I think it helped it helped keep maybe older kids from acting out more than than they might otherwise, because you know there's these there's six year olds in the school, and you mm -hmm. kind of have to mind your p's and q's. They kind of segregated it by you know all the older kids were on the second floor and, and the younger kids on the first, but in general they all interacted. And, um, you know, s similar type of school day, you know, seven, seven to three, mm -hmm. six, six classes a, a day. But it was almost more like a college schedule where they would take, um, they'd have their math class on, on Tuesday and Thursday and they'd have their English uh, or their oh. Russian on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. <clears throat> yeah. And um, the other thing that was different is their schools were set up kind of by, um, by area that the parents were interested in. The school I taught at focused on literature and languages. And there was like another school in town that focused on science and technology. So whatever you wanted your kid or whatever your kid was interested in, you could send them to the school that kind of fit their needs. Oh, that is so, interesting. Yeah. And, it, and it helps too because then the kids are more interested. You've got a built-in you know, interest not only in, 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 in school in general, but mm -hmm. in the subjects that they're learning. And you're not the only one at that school that that's uh, interested in one thing, there's a, yeah. a wide support group. Uh, that must have made teaching very uh, fascinating from the, from the standpoint of, first of all, having students who want to learn, who have this respect for knowledge and respect for education in the first place. Um, aside from being a curiosity as an American, were they uh, respectful of you as a teacher trying to teach them? Yeah, I mean, I think, especially initially, they were scared. You know, it was like, what is, how is this one going to be? And, 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 and even though they have a good relationship with the teachers and it's, a lot of it's built on respect, still some of it's built on fear. You know, they still have that, again, there's that leftover Soviet stuff of the respect for authority, you know, okay. much, much more. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the students still stand when, when the teacher comes into the room, you know, stuff like that. Uh -huh. So um, the, the thing that was most difficult for, for me to, to deal with kind of was that distance. You know, you, you, you're mm -hmm. not kind of used to that here. You seem like a very casual guy. Oh, yeah. And then and <laughs> the teachers there were, were really on, at times upset with, with some yeah, of the things that I did. undermining our status. Right. Ex <laughs> totally, yeah. And they, I remember one time one of the teachers came in while I was teaching, and I just happened to be like sitting on the edge of my desk. You know, I was just kind of like leaning, like casually, like sitting there. And she freaked out. She came in just like, David, David, what? Don't sit at the edge of your desk in front of the students. Uh, why? They will not respect you. <laughs> okay, oh. I think they will. <laughs> anyway, but They're just so, humans, right? Yeah, a little stuff and like that. And did you find them very human? I mean, the, yeah, the, that that attitude that the, that teacher had is kind of artificial. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because they still, you could tell the students still had that respect and, and some to a very extent love for, for the teachers, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's just a different kind and it's based on different. It's the 21st century still, right? Yeah. Uh, do they have exposure to technology and uh, uh, knowledge of the rest of the world? That's I mean, they had some. I mean, you know, they, they see some American movies and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone, is, it was interesting, everyone in Kazakhstan, it seemed like, um, knew how to say hello in English. I mean, if I walked down the street, hello, hello, it was like such a big deal to say hello to the American. Um, the only other word they knew was um, I, one I can't say, um, but it's from TV and from movies, and it's the mm -hmm. F word, and they all know that. Um, those are the two words. Everyone knew those. It was really <laughs> bizarre. That is bizarre. So that's, that's what, that, that was the, everyone had that kind of exposure to, uh, uh -huh. to America through the movies. And they, uh, um, so fellow teachers, had they been exposed to other Peace Corps volunteers prior to your arrival? 
Uh, I was the first teacher. When I got to Leningrad, there were two environmental volunteers working there, and that was they. They were the first, and they were finishing their second year when I started my first year. So they had had two Americans there, but they hadn't been in the schools at all, and they'd really been working with an um, like an American Kazakh consortium. Uh, doing just environmental studies and mm -hmm. stuff like that, so there wasn't much interaction, you know, among the, the people, except for the, you know, going to the market and stuff. Yeah. And did they uh, did they believe in the in the Peace Corps as a concept, or was, was it just? I think it was interesting. I mean, I think that it kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, it kind of blew their mind as to why a country would do that. You know, send people over <laughs> to help. Do. You know, they they always like, well, what do you what do you get paid, and why don't you have a car, <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I th I think they they appreciate, and again, you know, they have this vision of what America is based on that Soviet propaganda. So it was kind of difficult. Uh, I get a lot of questions all the time. Are you you're really a spy, aren't you? You're, you're here to spy on us. Yeah. I'm like what? What would I be spying on here? Our minds. You know, we have minds around here. <laughs> Uh, Mine, no. M-I-N-E-S. Yeah, mine. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, Leningrad used to be, it was like, it used to be a town of like 100,000, and there were a lot of uranium mines around. Oh, my. But uh, by the time I was there, they had pretty much been depleted, or uh, there's only one, I think, operating. The town was down to like 40,000 by the time I was there. So. And was that, uh, was that a source of sorrow for the remaining townspeople that they're, I mean, did they, was there this collective uh, feeling that the town was sliding downhill and they were second class or as a result or anything of that? Nature? I don't know that they thought about that. I think they just kind of accepted it. I mean, that's one thing that they got used to during the Soviet Union is just being resigned to things. You know, things happen. Yeah, life's, life's hard and that's just the way it is and, you know, mm -hmm. boo-hoo. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what did they, uh, why did they want to learn English in the first place? What's the it's, it's a badge of honor. I mean, it's important. They, they think it's important to learn English, to do anything, to be anybody, to have a chance to go to America. That's one thing. Okay. Um, to go to college, you know, that, that's, a, that's an important thing. Um, and I think, too, it's just like a lot of, uh, like Europe, it's just natural that, that they learn more languages. Yeah. Okay. They taught, you know, all, I had one kid in seventh grade who was, teach, who was learning and doing really well at English and Russian and Kazakh and German. And his kid is like, 12 years old and could speak in all wow. four of those languages. And so. does, in general, the students of that age, do they have a hope or a dream to, that they're, they would follow through on if their circumstances allowed? Yeah, I mean, all of them, it's, you know, depending upon, you know, they've got, although not as extreme as here, they've got classes, you know, middle class, lower class, all that. And so anyone with any kind of standing, you know, how, but even maybe even more so, um, lower standards still have that hope and, and thought that they could, they could, learning English and, and being even just associated with an American is going to give them some kind of mm -hmm. leg up. And, and I did help one of my students, uh, not at the school I was teaching at, but an extra school, um, get in a, a transfer program through um, AS, I think it was called Ex Excels. And he got to go to the states uh, to go, I think his junior year in high school, Texas, um, oh <laughs> and spent a year there. And he was really excited. And his mother just, his mother still like writes me letters and thanks me for, for changing his son. Because what ended up happening is he got involved with a family there that really liked him. And um, the, the program was set up so that you could only go for a year and you had to go back to Kazakhstan to show that you weren't trying to get in. So he did that. But then for college, he was able to go back and stay with this host family who the father worked for Texas A&M. So he was able to get him into Texas A&M, mm -hmm. um, where he were, went for three years. The, the, the guy later transferred, got a job at the University of Texas. And Sergey, a student, um, he offered to uh, let him move with them. So he finished his degree at Texas. He got uh, an internship at Merrill Lynch. And now he's working for Merrill Lynch in, in New Jersey. He's quite the little capitalist now. I mean, more so than I am. <laughs> I kind of I tease him about how I like ruined his life. Western fold, oh, yeah. hook, line, and sinker. Huh? And he, yeah. Well, that's a great story, though. I mean, it, it really is representative of what Peace Corps, what a Peace Corps volunteer can experience, can do, and and it's just <laughs> um, magnificent that a one-on-one -on -one thing like that can happen and. You know, you'll probably be in touch with this person for the rest of your life. Maybe oh, yeah. he'll help you uh, 
invest and make a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always like sending my like, joking out. Like, You're the financial whiz. Tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, uh, so <laughs> teaching was just one part of your of, of the service there, as I understand it, and and I guess this is kind of true in. Uh, I don't know if it's unique to Kazakhstan's uh, Peace Corps experiences, but you had to do other things as well, uh, additional chores, if you will. Yeah, yeah. They usually, I, th I think, pretty much around the world, if you're teaching English, they want you to do a secondary project, have a secondary project, because you got that three months off during the summer, and. Um, it, all English teachers, if there's not one already, are required to develop a, a teachers association for the English teachers in the towns so that they can resource and network um, to set up, if they don't already have one, an English language resource center uh, to provide okay. materials and English books and stuff like that for teachers to access. And then, again, your own secondary project. And mine was a youth, a youth center. Uh, because they didn't have anything like that, you know, they don't have, you know, they don't have bowling alleys, they don't have movie theaters, they don't have disco. Well, they had one little disco. It was kind of funny, um, but they don't have things for for kids to do after school. Um, right. They used to have, I think they used to have. I, I saw it like an old broken down amusement park, you know, really small, um, and and they do um, have some sports, you know, like basketball, stuff like that. But really, there's not much for the kids to do. And when I talk to them when I start, it's like, what do you guys do in your free time when you're not you know, doing homework? So we just walk the streets. You know. I decided to, to try to develop a, a youth center so they would have something to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so the focus of the center was recreation and, yeah. and social interaction as well? And yeah, Peace Corps does a good job of your tra during your training of, of giving you a little bit of development training so that you learn how to like write grants, how to secure support in country as well as internationally. And then Peace Corps even as a, a grant program where if you write to them, it's still competitive, then they will award grants based on you know, the project and how much mm -hmm. you're able to secure in country mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. And um, this type of... Uh, what did the elders of the of the city or the neighborhood think of your youth center? Was it? <laughs> they thought I was insane. They thought I would never be able to make it happen. Um, they're like, "Well, that costs money, and where would you put it? And where what would you put there? And um, you know, you'll never know. That will never happen." I mean, I, I realized early on that I wasn't going to be able to get it done with with the adults. It had to be with the kids. And then I did find one adult who was. Um, kind of gung ho about it, so that, mm -hmm. thank God, um, so she could in, you know interpret for, with the mayor with the Akeem. So yeah, I had to have the kids uh, be more excited about it to keep me excited yeah. and to overcome that Soviet inertia and dismissal from the from the mm -hmm. adults. And did that so once uh, it became a reality, the adults. Uh I think probably they're still there waiting for it to fold. <laughs> it's still there um, because they oh, keep in touch, you know, with, uh -huh. with some of my students still. And so I always ask them, like, the youth center is still there, yeah? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the new volunteer is, is kind of helping. And um, oh, it, it opened right before David. I left. Yeah, I got really lucky to see it open before I left. That's really great. Well, did they, and, and they and obviously must have enjoyed it if the enthusiasm oh, yeah. maintained. I mean, yeah, because, for example, um, the, it's the only pool table in town. You know, we got a pool table mm -hmm. from some guy who had a pool table in town, but he never used it. He just had it. I'm not sure. He probably, I think he was in the Russian military, so he had. You know, um, we had computers. We had a ping pong table. We had games and stuff like that. So and. It was interesting for the kids too because they they didn't come at first because they assumed that they had to pay, um, but once they realized that they didn't, then yeah, it was it was pretty constantly busy. But um, we did charge, they did end up charging to use some things for like printing, and com computers and stuff yeah. like that. So they could kind of make money to, to pay for the, the space. It was run out of a school. And the city, really surprisingly, but luckily, donated uh, the cost of the utilities because those are outrageous there. Uh, the heating costs, you know, it's yeah. Siberia. So that's <laughs> um, almost like half of someone's gross monthly income is, is taken up by utilities. No kidding. The, uh um, in the two minutes or so that we have left, I'd like to ask you, the theme of our program is bring the world home. What, what have you brought back, uh, or do you believe that is still uh, important from your Peace Corps experience in, in your life today? 
Uh, the coolest thing was a, a better awareness and understanding that you know the American way is not necessarily the right way. There, there's good things we have definitely. There are good aspects of American life and culture and ways of thought, but there are other ways of thought and thinking and doing things that are just as valuable and and for a lot of people you know more helpful. And for me, I picked up a better appreciation for a slower pace of life. You know, not needing to have that constant like going and doing. You know. mm -hmm. um, if if there wasn't something to do, I can I could entertain myself. Um, a better appreciation for human interaction, for lack of a better word, and less on stuff and things. Do you think that the Kazakhstanis, uh, I guess, if that's how you identify them, Kazakhs, uh, Kazakhs, do they believe now that? Uh, Peace Corps is a worthwhile way to spend American taxpayer dollars? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I mean, if nothing else, just for these kids, every time they go to that center, you know, that's something that they see has been the result of American, you know, uh, largesse, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Well, that's really great. Um, uh, David, we appreciate your sharing some of, and just a tiny bit of your experience here with us today about your time in Kazakhstan. And uh, I'd hope uh, maybe you might consider coming back uh, with us someday sure. and giving us more insight because I think this part of the world is, is uh, important to understand mm -hmm. better than we do. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciate the energy that uh, you put into your service there. It sounds like uh, the long-lasting ability. Thank you for tuning in with us today on Bring the World Home. Um, the Peace Corps is a way to learn about people around the world. It's a way to serve your country. It's a way to learn about yourself, perhaps most, most importantly. And uh, for those that might be interested, you can go to www.peacecorps.gov and see some of the countries, see what Peace Corps does, and uh, get another perspective. Today, David gave us an idea, and we hope that uh, we're able to uh, stimulate your imagination, perhaps uh, think about putting in an application for service in the Peace Corps or some other organization here in the United States and serving our country and serving yourself. Thank you very much for joining us again on Bring the World Home.